Hello, good afternoon. My name is Tanya Romankiewicz, and from this big picture that uh, Christian Christensen presented us, I will be stepping down a little bit and uh, I will be talking about architecture because I've been tasked from the session organizers to um, chase these petrification, liquefaction topics through prehistoric architecture. And I start from uh, you know, thinking about architecture not as producing products, but presenting processes of concept, contraction, and change over time. And I propose to trace these processes for a later prehistory, and I will concentrate on Scotland, which is the focus of my research. And at the end, I will reflect on the questions that have come up from the Scottish case studies, and I will look at a Scandinavian context, and I hope that having a few people who work in this area here in the room, that at the end there will be a minute or two to um, you know, have some comments for, for my speculation. My method analyzes architectural processes archaeologically. This is emphasizing on materials and their impact on the architectural design and the biography of the buildings. And the buildings I want to concentrate on are domestic houses. And I'd like to start with the Middle Bronze Age in northeast Scotland and look at the kind of fluid concepts of house architectures that I've discovered in studying the plants, and in particular, the wear patterns and these cut features that we see here. Oh, what happened there? Uh -huh. Too quick. To begin with, this house looks like a typical roundhouse with the post string and evidence suggests the turf wall, but we can see that the activities and energies inside are not reconcilable with the, the typical roundhouse. And um, these energies are deforming the architecture. Animals stored inside, um, the turf wall is malleable and allows to soak up nutrients, but also parts of it being taken down to let out the animals in springtime and spread the manure on the fields. So a very dynamic architecture that changes and reacts to these energies that are happening inside these houses. And um, at last year's EAA, I talked about um, how this kind of metamorphosing architecture connects with agricultural regimes at the times, and that these houses live on after abandonment. Um, because the turf is so nutrient enriched, they get plowed into, into gardens, and the houses that previously provided shelter, now provide the compost to grow the vegetables and so sustain life in, in a different, in a transformed, metamorphosed way. And we may assume that such dynamic concepts of architecture really only work with organic materials such as timber, turf and, and earth, but that, that they cannot really be realized in stones. And therefore, we may also assume that this is perhaps a regional phenomenon that we only see in areas where they are building timber roundhouses. However, if we look at stone building areas in Atlantic Scotland along the north coast, we see that at around the same time, a similar kind of metamorphosing plans and these also speak of complicated architectural processes and adjusting to these internal activities. The, the external e elevation, just as with these timber roundhouses that turn into pear-shaped roundhouses, this seems to be of, of a lesser concern. So it's not just restricted to organic um, materials. And what is then very interesting is that this changes over time. And in the Iron Age, we see these towers of the north appearing, these brochs, <laughs> and with their kind of massive stone facade that tower over the landscape. And we instantly question whether this is representing a kind of solidified product of architecture beyond these kind of Bronze Age dynamics that we've seen before. 
But again, a closer look, a look inside these structures, reveals that these dynamic concepts are still there within a porous dry stone shell. And in particular, inside we have these vertical bands of voids that allow the maybe individual rigid stone to move within its bond and react to high wind pressure by having these kind of relieving gas. So it is still, to some extent, a malleable shell. And if we look at the plans of these structures as well, we can see how different varieties, different ways of using this architecture is also reflected and can be expressed within this seemingly rigid Baroque architecture. And therefore, I would like to ask that we need to be more reactive to what we see in the prehistoric evidence in our reconstructions and think about alternatives of wall heights, of roof shape, and also accept that these different types of reconstructions could just be different phases of the same Bruch. But undeniably, solidification happens in the Iron Age. This dry stone shell is not as kind of dynamic as these Bronze Age houses were. If we look at southeast Scotland, for example, here the site of Broxmouth, we can detect this kind of solidification in these stone walled houses, where each new stone wall over time reduces the, the inwards and reduces, condensates the internal space. So perhaps the word petrification might spring to mind when we think of these internal activities that are happening in these buildings are getting con condensed. So we may ask what happens to the Middle Bronze Age houses that are looked at to begin with in Aberdeenshire? What happens to them in the Iron Age? And here we have a site plan of the site at Kintor where I showed the first roundhouse. And we can see that these Middle Bronze Age houses here in light blue um, the settlement shifts downwards towards the river and the late Bronze Age houses cluster here and then we see the early and middle Iron Age houses. And the houses get bigger, but there is another phenomenon happening that we can trace over time and that I want to uh, concentrate for, for this particular session on. And this is the burning of them. We see the orange dots, marks, burnt down houses. And this is up until the Middle Iron Age. And for the Roman Iron Age, which is not represented on this side, we turn to another site in the northeast, aptly pronounced Burmy at Murray. And again, here we have yellow, the early Iron Age houses, and then uh, green, the Roman Iron Age houses. And again, burning events. And this kind of increasing of houses ending their lives in flames. What does this burning do? Because we may assume that it reduces the organic materials such as the timbers and the roof materials to ash to produce a similar kind of fertile resource as for this kind of nutrient enrichment of the turf walls for in the, the Bronze Age houses. But the very use of the turf wall here, as shown in the reconstruction, at Burnie and at Kintour, prevents this burning to fertile ash. So the roof catches fire, but as soon as the roof turfs collapse, the flames are reduced to a smolder. And when the massive turf walls collapse on top of this, it turns the house into a charcoal kiln. And the massive timbers, as you can see here, they don't burn, they char. And this mineralization of the wood stops its life, but also stops its decay. In fact, so much that we can still excavate them as good as preserved as this today. And this is what led me to look at Denmark with the high proportion of burned down houses in the Iron Age. And last year, Christensen and colleagues analyzed these um, houses geographically and chronologically 
to discover that most of these date to the early Iron Age in, in Denmark, which chronologically runs up to about 200 AD, and that there is a high proportion of burnt houses to the west of the Great Belt, so specifically concentrating in Jutland. And Leo Webley has fine-grained this chronology, and I have plotted his data to reveal a concentration in northern Jutland, but also over time. Here we see the early pre-Roman Iron Age, then the late clustering here, and early Roman Iron Age, and the concentration there in the late Roman Iron Age as well. So there seems to be a clustering, and in particular in, in Jutland. It's quite cute. The question arises, why um, are the people in Jutland uh, so careless with, with the hearth fires? Is this just, um, what are they doing differently than the rest of Denmark? And Kristen and the colleagues have explained that this pattern could perhaps represent uh, an artifact of early excavators focusing on the area or because the burnt down houses are much better preserved, they are more easily discovered, or perhaps if we see this development, this rise in, in, the, Iron, in the Roman Iron Age, that perhaps there are um, social uh, instabilities that could represent um, you know, conflicts and houses are being burnt down for this. However, with the focus and context of our session with the petrification and my focus on materials, I would like to explore this burning a little bit differently because about 95% of the turf vault houses in Denmark also cluster in this region, in northern Jutland. And the large quantity of burnt down houses in this area could be due to these charring processes that um, I showed for, for burning and being <coughs> tours, so that similar uh, preservation processes are at work that char the organic materials. And in this sense, the houses are not fully burned to ash, but result in a kind of mineralization, a petrification, if you want. And the transformation of these organic decaying materials is into components that are preserved over time. And the fact that the timbers at Burnley, at Kintour, but seemingly also in Denmark, are not retrieved, and the houses are not ploughed into garden plots, as we've seen in the Bronze Age, this suggests to me that there are deliberate processes at work here, these kind of deliberate motiv motivations for, for petrifying these houses. And Marianne Helm Eriksson has recently investigated late Iron Age houses from Sweden and Norway. And in this, you know, this was kind of um, just recently published in the latest EGA. And she recognized that, um, these, that some of these houses who were later covered with burial mounds had also been previously burned. And for her, this also doesn't seem to be accidental. And she sees this as part of, of a burial rite of the house. And as far as I understand her theory, that the house is an agent in itself with its own life. And so these ideas have inspired my reading and understanding of these petrification processes that are presented here. But I would wish to emphasize that in the context of the turf architecture, we are not seeing a cremation that is an eradication of mass and substance, but a charring and the ending of process to, to halt decay. And so that to kind of petrify living houses and freeze them in time, the end of process. What I cannot answer yet, because this is still a research in proce progress, is why this happens and why this happens in the Iron Age. And it may be easy to kind of jump to conclusions that in the Iron Age societies are becoming more hierarchical, maybe perhaps more individually focused, and that um, we are therefore seeing a 
monumentalization of architecture um, or, and therefore also a preservation of architecture, but I think there are more complex processes at work here. As much as the Middle Bronze Age houses tied in with agricultural regimes and were part of a cycle and recycling, perhaps here we see a fragmentation of these cycles into different categories of architecture that can display something different and takes on a different agency than um, agricultural regimes. So this is something that I would like to explore a bit more and where I would very much invite comments as well from the audience, but not to forget to thank all the sponsors and collaborators. Thank you very much.